Hello everybody. Thank you all for joining us today. This webinar, Underfunding Reserves, is designed to help you understand the difference between the good behavior of being cost conscious about association money and the dangerous behavior of under-reserving. Today I'll share with you what we've learned about why boards underfund reserves, the consequences of under-reserving, and how a board can know confidently if their association is adequately funded. The question we're going to answer today is, if underfunding is so foolish, why do so many associations do it? Well, here at Association Reserves, we're by nature problem solvers, helping our clients get out of financial trouble and stay out of that kind of trouble. So today we're going to give you the tools to understand and address this problem at your association. Our goal is to prepare board members to make wise decisions about reserve funding, and help managers be able to speak convincingly to their clients on this subject. Well, as Chris mentioned, my name is Robert Nordland. I've prepared thousands of reserve studies over the past 27 years. Today I get to act as your problem solver. I get to help you avoid the financial and legal problems that begin when reserves have been underfunded. First, some tips for those of you who are new to our monthly webinars. You should have a control panel that looks something like this on the side of your screen. To ask a question at any time during the session, type it into the question box. Chris will monitor those throughout the session and I'll handle them at the Q&A session at the end of our time together. Now turn your attention to the hands raised icon. Grab your mouse and click the hands raised icon to show you're with me and ready to get going with today's session. Okay, I'm watching. Great. Seems like everyone's able to find their mouse. Give me some feedback. Okay, I'm going to put everyone's hands down. And here we go. I'm going to start off start out by outlining the four primary reasons why board members and managers are involved in underfunding reserves. The first is whether it's due to high number of foreclosures at the association or poor collection practices, many associations just plain hit a stumbling block when confronted with owners who don't voluntarily pay. They tend to hit a barrier and get stuck and that creates a cash flow problem and that cash flow problem often ends in reserve contributions not being made that month or for a few months. And face it, who wants to be known as the board who voted for higher assessments or a special assessment? But then again, who wants to be known as the board member or manager responsible for the driveway falling apart, the lobby looking run down, the roof leaking, or falling property values? Serving as a board member is a responsibility, not a casual hobby, and it takes courage and a thick skin. Third, some boards sense an obligation to keep assessments low. It may be for the motive of making the association more attractive to prospective buyers, or maybe it's just an attempt to keep assessments low so there's more money in the pockets of all the homeowners. But that argument just plain doesn't hold water. Roofs, asphalt, and other reserve projects don't care if reserve funds are being collected or not. Most reserve projects occur in a very predictable manner. If a board doesn't set assessments high enough to offset ongoing deterioration, owners will pay for that same deterioration at a later date by means of special assessments or loans. All you're changing by under-reserving is who pays for them and when. In general, the expenses are the same whether you set aside adequate reserves or not. All the major common area components at the association will deteriorate and need to be replaced. Period. If you under-reserve, you don't experience under expenses. In fact, I'll show later that many reserve expenses actually get larger due to under-reserving, making it net more expensive for the homeowners. And by the way, if you really want to save money, the least expensive way to pay for reserve projects is through regular budgeted reserve contributions. As this chart shows, 
if you're truly trying to save money, even with today's minimal interest earnings, the compounded interest over time that you get with budgeted reserve contributions means the bank will be helping you with your reserve contributions. You'll be able to pay for a $250,000 roof project with less than $250,000 of homeowner money. And of course the opposite is true. Getting a loan means the association is paying the bank, meaning a $250,000 roof project paid with loan proceeds will cost homeowners much more than $250,000. Failing to plan means inaction or stalling. This is a key point and it has to do with the business judgment rule. Now I'd like to pause here and ask a quick question. Chris is going to launch a uh, poll. Who believes they're familiar with the business judgment rule? Show me by a raise of hands. Are you familiar with the business judgment rule? If yes, raise your hand. Okay, looking at it, actually it looks like about half and half. Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to put everyone's hands down now. I'm not going to make a legal argument here, but I will take a moment to describe the business judgment rule as a legal principle that provides immunity from liability for board members or managers who are in the process of serving the association. Liability, immunity is great. So to have this business judgment rule immunity, three things must happen. First is the person must be acting within their authority and power. Second, the person must have made a reasonable inquiry. This sometimes you might have heard of as the prudent man theory. And third, the person must be acting in the best interests of the association. Now in this case, the first test is the most important acting within their authority. And that's because inaction is not behavior protected from liability under the business judgment rule. Doing nothing is not protected behavior under the business judgment rule. And a second element is notice that there's no exception for no money. So claiming to be broke is also not a defensible uh, claim for liability immunity under the business judgment rule. This is all about making decisions and it doesn't cost money to make the right decision. There may be some consequences of course, but that's of course the responsibility of the board of directors. So board of directors have no liability immunity if they fail to act and if they claim it's because of financial issues. Now there's an inaccurate stereotype that reserve projects are future expenses, problems that can be addressed by someone else at some future point in time, thus inaction. The truth is that reserve expenses are by and large very predictable expenses due to major components gradually deteriorating in plain sight on a daily basis over the course of many years. Reserve deterioration occurs very predictably on a daily basis, like a cash register that rings ka-ching every morning when the sun comes up. The value of that daily deterioration can be easily calculated. Reserve expenses are by and large not surprises. Board members and managers will have difficulty defending their inaction in light of this crystal clear fact. So to recap, the most common excuses for not making adequate reserves, meaning underfunding, are difficulty collecting, trying to avoid unpopular actions, trying to keep assessments low, and general lack of planning. Okay, um, I'm going to ask you again to give me a show of hands if you're with me so far. Give me a show of hands if you are seeing the four main reasons why board members and managers are involved with under-reserving. Okay, great. Thank you. Everyone's with me. I'm going to click hands down now. And it's at this point in time that we ask the question, what happens when an association underfunds reserves? And unlike fine wine, 
buildings don't get better with age. They just get more expensive. The first major consequence of underfunding reserves is what you see on screen. The risk of special assessment significantly increases. When there are major projects to be accomplished and through years of underfunding, the reserves become inadequate. In those cases, boards are forced to collect funds rapidly by way of special assessments. And special assessments are those catch-up payments that demand the, owners, uh, demand the owners pay a certain uh, sum of money to uh, catch up with the reserves that haven't been collected previously. Uh, it happens when prior owners haven't paid their fair share over time. So in addition to being the source of tension and ill will, special assessments are inherently unfair. Special assessments force the unfortunate owners at the time of the expense to pay for more than f their fair share of the cost of deterioration. Often that deterioration occurred long before they owned a unit in the association. Special assessments force new owners to pay more than their fair share. And if you're under-reserving now, it means that you're forcing your fair share of the cost of deterioration onto future owners. It's not fair for someone to have to pay for a new roof to replace an old one that someone else used up. And if a special assessment can't be passed, this forces an over-reliance on emergency bank loans, if and when they can get one, which layers debt on top of what's already been proven to be an inadequate income stream at the association. The unwitting victims of either a special assessment or loans are the unfortunate owners at the end of the project's service life who have to essentially subsidize all those prior owners who underpaid the cost of maintaining the property. In addition, underfunding significantly increases the risk of deferred maintenance. When a component is due to be replaced and the association delays accomplishing the project in a timely manner, the result is deferred maintenance. And as I mentioned earlier, deferred maintenance typically just increases costs at the association. Look at this association. There was not enough money to pay for a new roof, so while the association was trying to do some patching and get the votes for a special assessment, they had to install plastic draping on the units. How unsightly is that? It screams out to me and to everyone driving by the association, we weren't taking care of business. So in addition to paying for a new roof, they have to pay for the short-term repairs, and they're going through the hassle of last-minute scrambling to get the money they need for a roofing contractor. And here's a great example of an expense getting larger while ignored. Some advanced deterioration around windows due to waiting too long to repaint. It would have been much less expensive to paint the building on schedule rather than wait too long as this association has done and now have to bear the cost of some significant carpentry work. The same is true for most reserve projects. They just get more expensive when delayed. A third consequence is mortgage difficulties that prospective buyers face in applying for a loan or the problems that current owners face when they're trying to refinance. Federal mortgage entities like FHA, Fannie Mae, and Freddie Mac are all looking for the same minimum, and that minimum is summed up in one number. And that number is 10%. All three want to see the association setting aside at least 10% of their total budget towards reserves. Now, I need to make it clear that that's a step in the right direction, but be careful, it doesn't assure adequacy. What we found in our 27 years preparing reserve studies is that most associations need 15 to 40 percent of their total assessments going towards reserves in order to offset ongoing deterioration. So if your association is contributing under 10 percent of your total budget towards reserves, owners are going to have a problem financing refinancing, new buyers are going to have to pay higher interest rates since lenders feel they're taking on a higher risk loan and you're most likely headed towards underfunding your reserves. And when loans are less available because of the mortgage problems and interest rates are higher, that has a depressing effect on home values. 
And that's a nice segue to our next point, my next slide here, lower home values. In addition to the unfairness of pushing off your own expenses on future owners, poor curb appeal due to deferred maintenance and poor loan options, all of those together, you put them together, they have a chilling effect on what a real estate agent might have to say about the community. Honestly, if your association has special assessments, deferred maintenance, and poor financing options, homes are going to have to be attractively priced to keep prospective buyers from looking somewhere else. And finally, there's a the consequence of liability exposure. I don't like liability exposure and I don't know anyone who does. When you underfund reserves, you're gambling that a future owner, upset by paying more than their fair share of reserve expenses, won't be upset enough to reach back and sue you as a board member or manager for fiscally irresponsible action. Liability exposure from underfunding reserves is typically a multi-year trail with many board and manager names on it, each one contributing to the theme of underfunding. The question is if you want your name on that list or not. Now I mentioned earlier the business judgment rule, and that's significant because if it provides boards and managers protection from liability exposure when they're acting, what are the three things? Within their authority and power, after they've made reasonable inquiry, and in third, in the best interest of the association. Now, it will be hard to argue that decisions to underfund reserves, choking off the funds necessary to maintain the association's major assets, were done in the best interest of the association. That kind of decision looks very self-serving. That kind of decision looks like people more concerned about keeping their dues low than providing the funds needed by the association. And that means liability exposure. Liability exists for the board member and manager at two levels. Failing to do what's needed for the association, meaning failing to make fiscally responsible decisions to uphold a standard of care for the needs of the association, and failure to implement the recommendations of an independent professional, basically uh, failing to um, follow through on the research that you've performed. That means, in this case, failing to set the reserve contributions as recommended in your reserve study. Failing to follow wise counsel is foolish, and it invites liability exposure. If the board makes that reasonable inquiry about reserve needs by obtaining that reserve study, and they ignore its recommendations, they invite liability exposure. Now, there are wise and foolish decisions to be made here, and they're all recorded in the record of budget decisions made by the board and management through the years. So don't be making short-sighted, self-serving, foolish decisions think you can slip on by. They're all recorded in association records. So in review, the main consequences of under-reserving are an increased risk of unfair special assessments, an increased risk of unsightly and expensive deferred maintenance, additional difficulty getting favorable loans for prospective buyers or owners trying to refinance, lower home values, and increased board member and manager liability exposure. And uh, let's take a quick stop here and give me a show of hands. Do those five consequences look familiar to you? Is that what you would have guessed? Show of hands. Great, almost everyone. And just a reminder, if you do have a question, and I see a few there, type them into the question box, and we'll get to those at the end of the session. Okay, so let's change to the subject of finding out if your association is underfunded or not. It's all a matter of pace. Finding out if your reserve contributions have kept pace with the ongoing daily deterioration at the association. The first thing to know is that the information you need is in your current reserve study. And the things that reveal reserve, reserve fund strength are all well defined in national reserve study standards. You'll need a reserve study for your current year because a reserve study for a prior year gives you great information for that year, but by now it's out of date. It doesn't give you current guidance, the guidance that you need. 
every reserve study prepared according to National Reserve Study Standards has three results. The component list, that's the foundation of the reserve study, an evaluation of reserve fund strength, and a recommended contribution rate. I'm going to step back here and give you a quick quiz to see how much you know about reserve studies. So get your hands on your keyboard and join with me here. Let's do a little contest and get ready to type. Type your answer into the questions dialog box that we'll be watching. What makes the top two parts of the reserve study, the reserve fund strength and the funding plan, fundamentally different from the reserve component list? So the question again is, what makes the top two parts of the reserve study fundamentally different from the reserve component list? Okay, I'm starting to see results. First one, don't know, okay, <laughs> that's an honest answer. I'm seeing a few good guesses, not quite what I'm looking for. few more. Got it. Judith Smith. Thank you so much. So Judith got the answer that they're calculated based on the component list. They're created based on what's there in the component list. Thank you very much, Judith. Okay. Uh, the uh, three parts of that are found in a reserve study is all part of National Reserve Study Standards. And these have been around since 1998, so that's now 15 years. Okay, so with that introduction to reserve studies, let's focus on one of the calculated results, reserve fund strength. Reserve fund strength is measured in terms of percent funded, where 100% means the association has cash and reserves the same amount as their current deterioration. Those associations have strong, balanced reserves. Percent funded is the primary way an association can see if prior boards have chosen to set aside sufficient reserve contributions enough to keep pace with the ongoing deterioration going on there at the association. Associations over 100% funded have more cash than deterioration and associations under 100% funded have more deterioration than cash. And the amount of underfunding is significant because when an association's percent funded falls down to the 0 to 30 percent weak range, there is a high risk of special assessments and deferred maintenance due to the scarcity of reserve cash. Those associations are clearly underfunded. Associations in the 0 to 30 percent range regularly don't have enough money in reserves to perform their scheduled reserve projects in a timely manner. Now, the opposite is true, that special assessments and deferred maintenance are rare when reserve contributions have kept pace with ongoing daily reserve deterioration, and the percent funded is in the 70 to 130 percent strong range. You don't need to be 100 percent funded to have strong reserves. The strong range begins at about the 70 percent level. Now through this presentation today, my point is not to scare you. It's not all doom and gloom. Your reserve study tells you where you are and what to do about it. The good news is that you as board members and managers get to choose what the future looks like for you and your association. And if you're making decisions covered under the business judgment rule, you have great insulation from liability. Armed with more insights about why associations underfund and the consequences of underfunding, like we've gone through here today, we hope more associations will choose to avoid those problems and responsibly fund their reserves. Our job here at Association Reserves is to help you avoid problems. We feel like we act as a guide creating a reserve study for our clients that clearly identifies the scope and schedule of your upcoming reserve projects in their component list, calculating your reserve fund strength and special assessment risk, and calculating a clear, workable, and responsible funding plan that will help you avoid the problems we've discussed that are associated with underfunding. We want to lead you and guide you forward towards a successful future. We're on your side 
and our job is to help. We're good at it and we love bringing insight and order to the subject of budget planning for our client associations. And because there's only so much that I can do in this webinar and there's so much other material to cover on this entire subject of reserves, adequately funding and underfunding, I'd like to point out a few additional resources for you. Our job is to help associations avoid reserve problems, so we've tried to make our website a strong resource. So you can go to our website, www.reservestudy.com, and select the Learning Center tab, where you'll pl find plenty of reserve study articles organized by subject, some videos, national reserve study standards, legislative information from across the country, and recordings of prior webinars. And in addition, if you're not a current client and you'd like us to be on your team helping you avoid the problems of reserve underfunding, select our Request a Proposal tab and we'll get a proposal back to you in just a few days. We'd like to be of assistance to you, setting you up for success at your association. So let me leave you with a final thought. You can do it. If you think reserve contributions are expensive, consider the consequences of underfunding. Budgeted reserve contributions are the least expensive and most fair way to set aside adequate contributions for your association. And now that you know the undesirable consequences, hopefully the managers here will be better able to articulate the issues to their boards and the board members here in attendance will be more inclined to make wise decisions about adequately funding their reserves. And so at this, at this point in time, I'd like to turn the floor back to Chris and with the time remaining in our session, have her act as moderator for all the questions that you've typed in. So Chris, back to you.